Greetings from Washington, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, I wish I could be with you in person. But we've been busy all this past week filming scenes here at the FBI headquarters. Meanwhile, I know you're in capable hands with the cast of tonight's great screenplay, Miracle on 34th Street, from my home studio, 20th Century Fox. We are particularly gratified to have the original stars of the picture, Maureen O'Hara, John Payne, Edmund Gwynn, and Natalie Wood. Miracle on 34th Street takes up a question as old as the spirit of Christmas itself. Is there a Santa Claus? And answers that question very happily. This Christmas week, when most of us think of Lux Flakes as a friendly gift, I'm in the position of thanking Lux Flakes for a friendly gift. The opportunity to be with you at this Christmas presentation through the magic medium of radio. But I imagine many of you housewives feel grateful also, if for different reasons. Lux Flakes, I'm sure, hold out to you the gift of greater leisure, longer life for your precious fabrics, added sparkle to your silverware and dishes. And here's another present to you from Lux, as our curtain rises on Act One of Miracle on 34th Street. Starring Maureen O'Hara as Doris Walker, John Payne as Fred Gailey, Edmund Gwen as Chris Kingle, and Natalie Wood as Susan Walker. It's Thanksgiving Day in New York City. On Fifth Avenue, adjoining Central Park, an annual event is being joyfully awaited. The spectacular parade presented by Macy's Department Store to herald in the Christmas season. A little away from the crowd are two of Macy's public relations experts. He's simply wonderful, Mrs. Walker. Just look at him on that float. The most realistic Santa Claus we've ever had. Why, he didn't even need any padding, did he? Padding? Well, didn't you notice his tummy? So round, so firm, so fully packed. Well, now that everything's under control, where on earth did you find him? I don't know. I just turned around and there he was. And to think that the man whose place he took was, was intoxicated. With a breath that would knock over a reindeer. Oh, what if Mr. Macy had seen him? What if Mr. Gimble had seen him? Competition between our stores is tough enough as it is. Well, the parade's starting. Let's stand at the curb. Not I, Mr. Shellhammer. I'm going home and relax. Anyway, I can see it from there. I live just around the corner. Oh, so you do. Well, see you tomorrow, Mrs. Walker. And congratulations on finding the best Santa Claus in Macy's history. Certainly is a wonderful parade, Susan. Just look at that clown. Gosh, what a giant. Giant, Mr. Gailey? There are no such things as giants. Well, not now, maybe, but in olden days... Really, a... Mr. Gailey, and you a lawyer. Well, what about the giant that Jack killed? You know, Jack and the Beanstalk? Everybody knows that's a fairy tale. And I agree with my mother. Fairy tales are silly. Oh. Come in. Good afternoon. I'm Susan's mother. My maid says... Hello, that... Mother. I'm watching the parade. Mr. Gailey invited me. Hello, darling. Susie's told me quite a lot about you, Mrs. Walker. She's told me quite a lot about you, too, the man in the front department. <laughs> this is all part of a plot, Mrs. Walker. I'm very fond of Susie, but uh, I also wanted to meet you. Well, at least you're frank. Santa Claus. Don't even mention the name. Why not, Mother? That Santa Claus you see is a last-minute substitute. But why? Well, remember the way the janitor was last New Year's? Oh, my. Tired of an hour. I see Susie doesn't believe in Santa Claus either. That's right. She never has. Well, that's the end of the parade. Mother, I've been thinking. It's Thanksgiving, and there are only two of us. Couldn't we invite Mr. Gailey? Well, I... Oh, please don't bother. I'll just have a sandwich or something. But we have such a big turkey. Please, Mother, please. Well, well, I... Did I ask all right, Mr. Gailey? Susie, shh. You asked fine, Susan. Dinner's at three, Mr. Gailey. Hello, Mrs. Walker? Yes, Mr. Shellhammer? Your maid said you were at Thanksgiving dinner, but I just had to tell you, your Santa Claus was stupendous. <laughs> well, thank you. Mr. Macy himself wants him to be our toy department Santa Claus. Fine. Can you hire him? Well, I already have. 
Oh, he's a born salesman. I just feel it. Good. We'll talk about it in the morning. Thanks for calling, Mr. Shellhammer. <laughs> Here he is, Mr. Shellhammer. Here's Santa Claus. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you. Good morning, Santa Claus. Good morning. Now, before you go to the toy department, here's a list of toys that we have to push. You know, things we're overstocked on. Now, you'll find that a great many children will be undecided as to what they want for Christmas. Now, when that happens, you immediately suggest one of these items. You understand? I certainly do. Fine. Now, take the list, and Alfred here will show you to your throne in the toy department. And don't forget... You're working for Macy's. Are you really Santa Claus? Why, of course I am. And what do you want for Christmas, little boy? I want a fire engine with a real hose that squirts real wet water. And I won't do it in the house. I'll only do it in the backyard. I promise. And I promise you'll get your fire engine. You see, Mama? I told you he'd get me one. That's fine. That's just dandy. You wait here, Mortimer. Mama wants to thank Santa Claus, too. Yes, madam? Say, so what's the matter with you? Now, now, now. What's the trouble? I told you before, didn't I? The kid wants a fire engine, but there isn't one to be had anywhere in town. Macy's ain't got it. Any gimbals ain't got any. Nobody's got any. My feet are killing me, and you say, okay, he gets the fire engine. Mm, but you can get those fire engines at Schoenfeld's on Lexington Avenue. Only four fifty. Wonderful bargain. Schoenfeld? Mm. Hey, I, I don't get it. Oh, I follow the toy market very closely. Macy sending people to other stores? Mm -hmm. Are you kidding? Well, the one important thing is to make the children happy, isn't it? Whether Macy's or somebody else sells the toy doesn't matter. Don't you feel that way? Uh, who, me? Yes. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, sure. Only I didn't know Macy's did. I don't get it. I just don't get Who's it. Who's next, please? Right this way to see Santa Claus. All right, little girl. You're next. Well, of course, little girl. You want some roller skates? Well, you shall have them, too. Oh, Mama, Mama. He's going to bring me some roller skates. Yes, he has some fine skates here at Macy's, haven't you, Santa Claus? Oh, they're good skates, all right, but not quite good enough. Now, I left some really wonderful roller skates at Gimbel's. I'm sure Gimbel's have just what this good little girl wants. Mr. Shellhammer. Are you Mr. Shellhammer? Gimbel's. Gimbel's? That's just what he did say. Gimbel's. Uh, the sales lady said I should speak to you. Gimbel's. I just wanted to congratulate you and Macy's on this wonderful new stunt you're pulling. Imagine a big outfit like Macy's putting the spirit of Christmas ahead of the commercial. Well, from now on, I'm going to be a regular Macy customer. All right, Mortimer, we're going. Gimbal! department over there, Mr. Gailey. You certainly know all about Macy's store, don't you, Susie? Well, that's because my mother works here. But I still think it's silly, bringing me here to see Santa Claus. Well, I just felt that if you talked to him, maybe... Okay, the... Mr. Gailey. I'm certainly willing to try. Well, well, what a fine young lady. And what's your name, little girl? Susan Walker. What's yours? Mine? Chris Kringle. I'm Santa Claus. Hmm. Oh, you don't believe that, eh? No. You see, my mother is Mrs. Walker. Oh. But I must say, you're the best-looking Santa Claus I've ever seen. Really? Your beard, for instance. It doesn't have one of those things that goes over your ears. Well, that's because it's real. Just like I'm really Santa Claus. Go ahead. Pull it. Well, my... my goodness. It is real. Yes. <laughs> now, what would you like me to bring you for Christmas? Nothing, thank you. Whatever I want, my mother will get for me. If it's sensible and doesn't cost too much, of course. That's quite right, Susan. Oh, hello, Mother. Hello, hello Mr. Gailey. Hello. The uh, explanation for this is all very simple. Your maid's mother sprained her ankle. She had to go home. She asked me to bring Susie down to you. And as long as we were here, I figured we might as well say hello to Santa Claus. He has real whiskers, Mother. Susan, would you mind standing over there a minute? If you want me to. I shouldn't have brought Susan to see Santa, is that it? Oh, now you're making me feel completely heartless. I'm sorry. Don't you see, I tell Susan that Santa Claus is a myth, and you show her a very convincing old man with real whiskers. Whom is she to believe? Yeah, yeah, that's right, isn't it? When Susan was a baby, her father and I were divorced. Ever since then, I've protected my child by teaching her realities. 
If you don't believe in fairy tales and fantasy, you can never be hurt or disillusioned. We were talking about Susie, Mrs. Walker. And I must ask you to let me raise her as I see fit. All right, dear, we'll run along to my office now. Alfred said you wanted to see me, Mrs. Walker. Uh, oh, yes, yes. I, uh... I'd be grateful if you'd please tell Susan that you're not really Santa Claus, that there actually is no such person. But, Mrs. Walker, not only is there such a person, but here I am to prove it. No, 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 you must understand. I want you to tell her the truth. Now, uh, what's your real name? Chris Kringle, and I always tell the truth. Susan, I'll bet you're in the first grade. Second grade? I mean your real name. That is my real name. My goodness, the second grade? Very well. I have your employment card right here. I'll look it up on that. That's a very cute dress, Susan. It's from Macy's. We get 10% off. Oh. So, you always tell the truth, do you? Look at your employment card. Name, Chris Kringle. Address, Brooks Memorial Home, Great Neck, Long Island. You may call the home if you care to confirm that, Mrs. Walker. It's a home for elderly gentlemen. Would you also like me to confirm this? What's that? Date of birth. As old as my tongue and a little bit older than my teeth. Place of birth, North Pole. Now, really. Why, I believe you doubt me, Mrs. Walker. And this tops everything. Next of kin. Oh, there. Dasher, dancer, prancer, and vixen. <laughs> I'm sorry to have to do this, Mr. Uh, uh, Kringle. Um, but the, uh, the Santa Claus that we had two years ago is back in town, and I feel that we owe it to him to... What, uh, have I done something wrong? Uh, no, no, it's just that we feel... Oh, excuse me. Hello? This is Mr. Shellhammer, Mrs. Walker. Drop whatever you're doing. Mr. Macy wants to see us immediately. Oh, I'll be right up. Um, I'm afraid I'll have to be very abrupt with you. I have to see Mr. Macy. You'll be paid for the full week, Mr. Kringle, and I'll send your check to that address. Come right in, Mrs. Walker, Mr. Shellhammer. Thank you, Mr. Macy. Now, about this new policy you two initiated. Oh, oh. Macy's Santa Claus sending customers to Gimbel's. I, I, I can explain everything, Mr. Macy. You don't Macy. have to explain a thing. Just look at my desk. Forty-two telegrams and over 500 phone calls. Grateful parents expressing undying gratitude to Macy's department store. Well, you... You don't say. From now on, not only will our Santa Claus continue in this manner, but every salesperson in the entire store. You... You mean if we haven't got what the customer asks for, we're to... We're to send him where he can get it. No high pressuring, no forcing a customer to take something he doesn't really want. I, I think that's wonderful, Mr. Macy. We'll be known as the helpful store, the friendly store, the store that places public service ahead of profits. And um, consequently, we'll make more profits than ever. As for you, Mrs. Walker, Mr. Shellhammer, you'll find a more practical expression of my gratitude in your Christmas envelopes. Oh, thank, thank you. you. And thank tell you. that wonderful Santa Claus I won't forget him either. Matter of fact, I'll tell him myself in the morning. Yes, indeed, Mr. Macy. Good night, good night. Good night, Mr. Macy. And thank you again, sir. Imagine, a bonus. Yes. Well, what's the matter with you? Mr. Shellhammer, I, I just fired him. Uh, who? Santa Claus. Oh, no. No, you couldn't have. But I, I did. He's crazy, Mr. Shellhammer. He really thinks he is Santa Claus. I don't care if he thinks he's the Easter Bunny. Find him. Oh, no, no, no. In a moment, we'll continue with Miracle on 34th Street. Say, Libby, I understand you were at that wonderful party RKO gave last month... For the company of Tycoon, after they finished the picture. Yes, indeed. And I met so many interesting people. Lorraine Day introduced me to John Wayne, who co-starred with her in the picture. He was telling me what marvelous Technicolor shots they got on location in the Sierras. Anybody else I know there? Well, Rosalind Russell made quite a stir when she dropped in with RKO's two British stars, Michael Redgrave and Leo Ginn. Rosalind looking, as usual, like one of the ten best-dressed women in America? <laughs> well, like the best-dressed belle of 1865 this time. Because the three of them came right from the set of Morning Becomes Electra. Rosalind was still wearing her hoop skirts and poke bonnet. She has a very exacting role in that picture. In more ways than one. Her stockings took more punishment than any other part of her costume. Because the sound stage for the mansion set has real sod on it that was watered several times a day. Rosalind changed her shoes and stockings constantly because of the dampness. So her maid had five or six pairs to Lux every night. 
You did say Lux. Well, naturally. Stars as well as the Hollywood studios know how important Lux flakes are in making stockings last longer. We do know that's true from those famous strain tests made by an impartial laboratory. When they washed stockings with a strong soap or rubbed them with cake soap, pop went runs in a surprisingly short time. But the very same kinds of stockings, washed with Lux flakes, lasted twice as long. That was true of nylon, silk, rayon, and cotton alike. That's a good tip for girls who get some of the new smoky-toned nylons for Christmas. They can make them last much longer, keep the colors lovely longer, if they lux them regularly. Lux helps stockings last twice as long. So, with gentle Lux care, you can get the wear of an extra pair from every pair of stockings. We continue with Act Two of Miracle on 34th Street, starring Maureen O'Hara as Doris Walker, John Payne as Fred Gailey, Edmund Gwen as Chris Kringle, and Natalie Wood as Susan. It was a frantic few hours that Doris spent last night rushing out to the Brooks Memorial Home in Long Island and assuring Chris Kringle that Macy's wanted him back as Santa Claus. So Chris is again presiding over the crowded toy department. While in her office, Doris and Mr. Shellhammer... Don't you understand, Mr. Shellhammer? That old man with the nice white whiskers insists that he is Santa Claus. He's out of his mind. What if he should have a... A fit or something. Oh, no, I've got to tell Mr. Macy. But maybe he's only a little crazy. Anyway, you can't be sure till he's examined. We'll send him to Mr. Sawyer. Sawyer? In personnel. He's paid to examine employees, isn't he? Now, by the way, what do you think of this? What is it? A full-page ad Macy's is running in tomorrow's newspapers. Macy's is running it? But it's all about the other stores, Gimbel's and Sachs. I know, I know. Mr. Macy's idea to help our customers find what they want. Revolting, isn't it? <laughs> that Santa Claus certainly has started something. Oh, well, I'll get hold of him in his lunch hour and I'll send him up to Mr. Sawyer. So I changed my clothes, Mr. Sawyer, and came right up. Oh, then that's your own beard, huh? Oh, yes. Uh, interesting complex in back of that. Why do you carry a cane? Always carry a cane, Mr. Sawyer. Well, that is when I wear street clothes. Oh. I carved this cane out of a runner from one of my old sleighs. What's that? What's that? With a fine, solid silver top. Who was the first president of the United States? Oh, give me a difficult one. Like, uh... Like who was vice president under John Quincy Adams? I'm conducting this examination. The answer is Daniel D. Tompkins. Ah, yeah. Oh, you're a... You're a rather nervous man, aren't you? Oh. Do you get enough sleep? My personal habits are no concern of yours. Now, what hand am I holding up? Right hand? How many fingers do you see? Three. Oh, dear, dear, dear. And you bite your nails, what? too. Oh, oh. <laughs> Stand up now. Feet together, arms extended. Muscular coordination test? I've taken dozens of these tests. Mr. Sawyer, are you happy at home? That, that will be all, Mr. Kringle. The examination's over. Thank you. And it may interest you to know that I've been happily married, very happily, for 22 years, very happily married. Delighted to hear it. Uh, Bye, Mr. Sawyer. Uh, Bye. Miss Prawn. Yes, sir. Get Mrs. Walker on the phone. Yes, sir. But your wife, Mr. Sawyer, she's called four times already. Tell my big fat wife to shut up my own business. Here's Mrs. Walker, sir. Oh. <clears throat> Hello? I was just going to call you, Mr. Sawyer. There's a Dr. Pierce stopping by this afternoon at three. Who, who's Dr. Pierce? He's the physician at the Brooks home. I thought we might discuss Mr. Kringle's case with him. Well, there's hardly any point in discussing it, Mrs. Walker. Obviously, the old man should be discharged. Dr. Pierce, Kringle should be dismissed immediately and sent to a mental institution. Oh, now, just a moment. But he's deluded, <laughs> saying that he's Santa Claus. Well, it's a delusion for good. I found he only wants to be friendly and helpful. Now, his whole manner suggests aggressiveness. Why, look at the way he carries that cane. Well, Mrs. Walker, naturally, I can't discharge that loony. So when he exhibits his maniacal tendencies, please realize the responsibility is completely yours. 
Well, I'm right back where I started. Mrs. Walker, I assure you, Chris Kringle has no maniacal tendencies. What if there's the slightest possibility of his causing any trouble? Well, what trouble? All that need happen is that a policeman ask him his name. Chris Kringle, clang, clang, and Macy Santa Claus lands up in the psychopathic ward. Well, you can prevent that very simply. Uh, there must be someone here at the store who could rent him a room. Then they could both come to work together. I'd just as soon he avoided that long train ride to Long Island anyway. You mean sort of take custody of him? Yeah. Do you think Mr. Kringle would agree to that? Well, I'm sure he'll agree. Well, in that case... Now, let's see. Who do I know who could rent him a room? I'm glad you're going to have dinner with us, Mr. Kringle. Oh, thank you, Susan. I'm also very glad you're going to live next door with Mr. Gailey. Oh, why? Because you're nice to talk to. Oh, oh. what a fine young man that Mr. Gailey is, eh? Just think, allowing me to share his apartment, a mere stranger. Confidentially, he did it because Mother hinted to him. Oh, well, anyway, I'm very grateful. Shall I tell you what I did in school today? Yeah, by all means. Any games? Yes, and a very silly game, too. They played zoo, and each child was supposed to be an animal. But, Susie, they were just pretending. Well, that's what makes the game so silly. Well, of course, in order to play games, you need imagination. Oh, that's when you see things, but they're not really there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but you know, to me, imagination is a place all by itself. Now, you've heard of the French nation, the British nation. Well, this is the imagination. A very interesting place, too. Now, how would you like to be able to make snowballs in the summertime, eh? Or, or be the Statue of Liberty in the morning, and in the afternoon, fly south with a flock of geese? Oh, I'm quite sure I'd like it, but... Oh, it's very simple. Now, look here. Anyway, the next time they play zoo, you can be a monkey. But I don't know how to be a monkey. Don't you? Here, I'll show you. Now, first you bend over a little, like, uh, like this, see? Now, let your arms hang loose, see? Eh? Like this? Yeah, yeah, that's fine, fine. Now put your hand over here and start scratching, see? <laughs> that's excellent, Susan, excellent. That's as fine a bit of scratching as I've ever seen. Well, now, now start chattering. Chattering? Yes, chattering. Listen, now. <laughs> see, I, I, I keep on scratching. Now then, we'll do it together, see? Chatter and scratch and scratch and chatter. Huh? Oh, that's fine, Susan. Fine, you're doing beautifully. <laughs> Susan. Susan. You still awake? Yes. I've just come in to say good night. Susan, about Christmas. There must be something you'd like for Christmas. Well, I've certainly thought about something, Mr. Yeah. Kringle. What is it, eh? Tell me. It's right here on the night table. Oh? See, I tore this page out of the magazine. It's a picture of a house. Oh, that's what you want, eh? A doll's house. Colonial architecture. Oh, no. Not a doll's house. A real house. A real house? Yes, and if you're really Santa Claus, you can get it for me. Oh, now, 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 now. Wait a minute, Susie. <laughs> What could you possibly do with a big house? Live in it with my mother. And I want a great big backyard with a great big tree to put a swing on, and a garden, and a... Oh, well. Why even discuss it? Oh. Uh, Susie, could I, um... Could I keep this picture just, uh, Just in case? I guess so. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Gale is waiting for me. Good night, monkey. Good night, Mr. Kringle. Take whichever bed you want, Mr. Kringle. Oh, you're very kind, really. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Gailey, just what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a lawyer. Haslip, Haslip, Sherman, McKenzie. Oh. And you, uh, you like living here in the city? Well, it's convenient. But someday I'd like to get a place out on Long Island. Not a big house, just one of those junior partner deals around Manhasset. One of those little colonial houses, eh? Yeah, yeah. A little colonial house would be swell. Oh. You're, um, 
You're quite fond of Mrs. Walker, aren't you? Yeah. A lot of good it does me. She lives in a cast iron shell that's a little difficult to penetrate. Oh, you must try harder, Mr. Gailey. Mrs. Walker and that child are a couple of lost souls, and it's up to us to help them. Oh, well, shall I turn out the light? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to be cheated out of this. You know, all my life I've wondered about it, and now I'm going to find out. Does Santa Claus sleep with his whiskers inside or outside the covers? <laughs> oh, outside, of course. Outside, by all means. The cold makes them grow. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, come in, Mrs. Walker. Come in. Thank you, Mr. Macy. I've just heard something very exciting. You have? Well, let me tell you something very exciting. Our policy of being kind to customers has tripled our sales. Now, what do you think of that? Well, that's wonderful, Mr. Macy. And Gimbel's thinks it's wonderful, too. Gimbel's? Gimbel's are adopting the same policy. Well, is that so? And it gives me an idea. As long as Gimbel's are doing the same thing, why not some pictures for the newspapers? Pictures? Yes, you and Mr. Gimbel shaking hands. Shaking hands? R.H. Macy and, and Gimbel? Well, well, yes. Hmm... Yes, why not? With Santa Claus, it's a great idea, Mrs. Walker. Macy and Gimbel, shaking hands. That's enough pictures, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Gimbel? Come on, R.H. Now we'll go over to my store and get some really good pictures. <laughs> Just a minute. I have something here for Santa Claus. Here you are, Mr. Kringle, a check in appreciation of all Mr. you've done. Now, Macy, why, that's most kind of you. I didn't think you were that generous, R.H. Well, that's quite a check. Uh, what are you going to do with it, Mr. Kringle? Well, I have a friend, a Dr. Pierce. He needs a new x-ray machine. Buy the machine through the store. A uh, 10% discount. Nonsense! Come over to Gimbel's and we'll furnish it at cost. Keep it up, gentlemen. Keep it up. <laughs> at this rate, my friend will have a whole new hospital. <laughs> <laughs> How did the pictures turn out, Mr. Kringle? Oh, fine, Alfred, fine. How about a game of checkers during lunch? No, not today, Chris. I, I don't feel so good. Huh? What's the matter, Alfred? Oh, nothing much. You remember I was telling you how I like to play Santa Claus over at the Y and mm -hmm. give out packages to the kids? Yeah. Well, I was telling Mr. Sawyer about it, and he says that's very bad, that psychologically it's all wrong. Wrong? To be nice to children? Well, he says guys who play Santa Claus do it because when they was young, they must have done something bad. Now they do something they think is good to make up for it, see? It's what he calls a guilt complex. Alfred... What else has he found wrong with you? Oh, nothing much. Just that I hate my father. I didn't know it, but he says I do. Excuse me. Hey, ain't you going to lunch? Later. Right now I have an appointment with Mr. Sawyer. Uh, what do you mean, breaking into my office like this? Are you a licensed psychiatrist? What business is it of yours? I have great respect for psychiatry and great contempt for meddling amateurs who go around practicing it. Shut up! You ought to be horsewhipped. Taking a boy like Alfred and filling him up with complices and phobias and... I think I'm better equipped to judge that than you. Just because Alfred wants to be kind to children, you tell him he has a guilt complex. Having the same delusion you couldn't possibly understand. And don't you wave that cane at me. Either you stop analyzing Alfred or I'll go straight to Mr. Macy and tell him what a contemptible fraud you are. Get out of here. Get out of here before I have you thrown out. There's only one way to handle a man like you. Well... Maybe this'll knock some sense into Oh, for help! Oh, oh, my head, my head, oh, oh. Good day, Mr. Sawyer. Oh, Miss Prawn, Miss Prawn. Get me the police, get me Mrs. Walker, get me the psychopathic ward at Bellevue Hospital. You can see Mr. Crinkle now, Mr. Gailey. Thank you, nurse. Hello, Chris. Hello, Fred. Chris, I've been speaking to the doctors. They said they've given you some tests. Yeah, same old tests. Except this time you failed to pass them. Chris, you deliberately failed them. Why? Because I had great hopes, Fred. I had a feeling Mrs. Walker was beginning to believe in me. Now I discover she was only humoring me all the time. But this wasn't Doris's idea at all. Mr. Sawyer had you sent here before she even knew about it. But why didn't she come to me and explain things? Because she didn't want to hurt you. Oh, it's not just Mrs. Walker, Fred... 
Now, take Mr. Sawyer. He's contemptible, dishonest, deceitful. Yet he's out there and I'm in here. Well, if that's normal, I don't want it. But you can't just think of yourself, Chris. What happens to you matters to a lot of other people. People like me who believe in what you stand for and people like, well, like Susie who are just beginning to. Chris, you're letting us down. No, maybe you're right, Fred. You, you, of course you're right. I ought to be ashamed of myself. Let's get out of here. Now, wait a minute. You flunked your mental examination, but good. Oh, yes. Yes, so I did. So I... Here, well, you're a lawyer. You fix it. Hey, now, look, I... I won't let you down, and you won't let me down. Chris, take it easy, will you? Look, there'll have to be a hearing. If you're going to be committed, it's got to go before a judge. Well? Well, if I can do anything at all, it'll have to be in that courtroom. Now, sit tight, Chris. I'll get an idea. I'll have to get an idea. <laughs> Uh, uh, sent for me, Mr. Macy. I certainly did, Mr. Sawyer. I brought my family to the toy department to see our Santa Claus. And our Santa Claus isn't there. He's in Bellevue. Uh, yes, Mr. Macy. Because he's a lunatic. Yes, sir. Lunatic. Lunatic, my foot. You listen to me, Sawyer. You get that case dropped right away, you'll have another lump to match the one he gave you. But it's out of my hands. Mr. Kringle goes to court in the morning. Well, just see that he's back in the toy department by afternoon. Now get out of here. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Gailey. Yes? I've been looking all over for you. I'm uh, Mr. Sawyer. Oh, so you're Sawyer. Yes. I was just speaking to the court clerk, and he said you represent Mr. Kringle. Well, uh, I represent Mr. Macy. Then I'll see you in court. Oh, well, that's what I wanted to speak to you about. Now, uh, Mr. Macy would like to drop the whole case right now. You see, we're most anxious to avoid uh, any uh, publicity. No publicity, huh? That's very interesting. Ah, then you'll, uh, you'll cooperate? You know something, Sawyer? You've just given me the idea I've been searching for. Oh, good, good. If I'm going to win this case, I'm going to have to have public opinion and plenty of it. And publicity's just the way to do it. Thanks and so long, Sawyer. Mr. Gailey! But, but, but Mr. Gailey! Look at these newspapers, Chris. Here, Evening Dispatch. Doctors doubt sanity of Santa who launched goodwill campaign. Oh, my. Daily Bulletin. Macy's Santa Claus to have lunacy hearing. What's this one? New York Star. Is Chris Kringle crazy? Court case coming? Kitties cry <laughs> calamity? You've driven the United Nations clear back to page five. <laughs> Get a good night's sleep, Chris. We go before Judge Harper at ten tomorrow morning. Okay. Pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We'll return with Miracle on 34th Street in a moment. If it's possible to be born an actress, our guest tonight was. For Barbara B.B. Lyon is the daughter of two famous parents, B.B. Daniels and Ben Lyon, the well-known screen stars who are now on the executive end of motion pictures. You know, Barbara, you resemble your mother very much. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. That's a great compliment. But I know I'll have to work hard and make a place for myself. Right now I'm studying dramatics. And visiting the studios to study techniques? That's right. I spent a lot of time at 20th Century Fox watching them make Gentleman's Agreement. Dorothy McGuire is so natural. She's marvelous. And Gregory Peck turns in one of his finest performances in that story of present-day intolerance. Yes, and I was interested in Celeste Holm, too, because she plays her first straight dramatic role in Gentleman's Agreement. Afterwards, she asked me to tea in her dressing room. But an uninvited guest almost spoiled the party. Who was that? Gregory's dog, Perry. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a pet. He thought he was invited, too, and... In his enthusiasm, bumped Celeste's elbow and she spilled cream over her lovely negligee. But, and this is why I'm telling you the story, Mr. Kennedy, Celeste wasn't a bit disturbed. She just handed the robe to her maid and told her to lux it right away. She couldn't give it safer treatment. Studio wardrobe departments specify lux care for everything safe in water alone. So do Mother and I. Since she's been back from England where Mother and Dad spent the war years, we've been splurging on lingerie. 
But it really doesn't seem extravagant because nice things last so long with Lux Care. Lux Care actually does keep under things lovely three times as long. So any girl who gives her under things Lux Care can have three times as many without spending a bit more. Instead of just replacing under things that have grown faded and old looking from wrong washing, she can buy extra new ones. Soon have three times as many because they stay lovely three times as long. Thank you for coming tonight, Barbara Lyon. Now, here's Act Three of Miracle on 34th Street, starring Marina Hera as Doris Walker, John Payne as Fred Gailey, Edmund Gwen as Chris, and Natalie Wood as Susan. For a few weeks, a jolly elderly gentleman named Chris Kringle has been working minor miracles as the Santa Claus of Macy's department store. But now his sanity has been seriously questioned. And in a crowded courtroom, Judge Harper listens patiently as the assistant district attorney summons Chris to the witness stand. Now, this is not a trial, Mr. Kringle. It's just a hearing, so you don't have to answer any questions. Now then, where do you live, please? Well, it seems to me that's what this hearing will decide, won't it? Uh, Mr. Kringle, do you believe that you are Santa Claus? Of course I do. That's all, Your Honor. The state rests its case. Well, Mr. Gailey, Your Honor, Mr. Mara contends my client is not sane because he believes he is Santa Claus. An entirely logical conclusion. Anyone who thinks he's Santa Claus is crazy. Your Honor, you believe yourself to be Judge Harper, yet no one questions your sanity because you are Judge Harper, do they? Mr. Kringle is the subject of this sanity hearing, not I. Very well, Your Honor. But I intend to prove that Mr. Kringle is Santa Claus. <laughs> Mr. Mara. I thought you said this was a cut-and-dried sanity hearing. I thought it was, Your Honor. In the view of Mr. Gailey's statement, I'll have to review the entire background of this case. Court's adjourned till tomorrow morning. Hello, Doris. I'm sorry I'm late, but get ready. We're really going to celebrate tonight. What are we celebrating? Well, didn't you read the papers? Santa's mouthpiece throws bombshell in New York Supreme Court. Fred, you're not really serious about this. You can't possibly prove that Chris is Santa Claus. Well, you saw Mr. Macy and Mr. Gimble shake hands. That wasn't possible either. And what does your firm have to say about it, Hayslip and McKenzie and, and the rest of them? That I've jeopardized their prestige, and either I drop this impossible case or they'll drop me. You see? So I beat them to it. I quit. Fred, you threw away your career because of a sentimental whim? Well, I'll open my own office. And what kind of clients will you get? Oh, Probably a lot of people like Chris are being pushed around. You know, that's the only fun in law anyway. Doris, look, don't you have any faith at all in me? Oh, it's not a question of faith. It's common sense. But faith is believing in things when common sense tells you not to. It's not just Chris that's on trial. It's, it's everything he stands for. Human kindness and love. Fred, listen. We've seen a lot of each other the last couple of weeks. I, well, I, I've become very fond of you. We've talked about some wonderful plans, haven't we? And then you do this. You go on an idealistic binge, throw away your security, and you expect me to be happy about it. And I expect too much, is that it? Well, that's that, I guess. Good night, Doris. Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Mara. Well, can't I wait till tomorrow? I'm eating di Who's been subpoenaed? Well, how do you think I feel about it? I'll see you tomorrow. Who's that, dear? R.H. Macy's been subpoenaed. Oh, my. Oh, those reporters. They make me look like a sadistic monster who likes nothing better than to drown pussycats and tear wings off of butterflies. Quiet, you're quiet. Tommy's still awake. Oh, oh, yeah. It'd just break his heart if he knew what his daddy's doing. I'm doing my job as assistant district attorney. Well, I'm not so sure, but that I agree with them. Mr. Kringle looks like a very nice old man, and I don't see why you have to keep persecuting him. I'm not persecuting him. I'm prosecuting him. I like the old man, too, but there's nothing I can do about it. You know something, Thomas? Sometimes I wish I'd married a butcher or a plumber. Well, if I lose this case, it's very possible you'll get your wish. R.H. <laughs> Macy, and I wonder what he's going to pull from Proceed with the witness, Mr. Gailey. Now then, Mr. Macy, if you recognize the defendant, please tell us who he is. Chris Kringle, of course. Do you believe him to be of sound mind? Sound mind? I wish I had a dozen like him. Mr. Macy, you're under oath. 
Do you believe that man is Santa Claus? Well, now, that's rather a delicate... Careful, uh... R.H., just think of those headlines tomorrow. Macy admits his Santa Claus is fraud. You keep out of this, Gimbal. What did you say? Uh, nothing, nothing, Mr. Mara. Uh, I wish you would. Is that man Santa Claus? Yes. In my opinion, he most certainly is. Your Honor, there is no such person as Santa Claus, and everybody knows it. Can you prove there isn't any? I won't even try. I'll not waste the court's time with such childish nonsense. Your Honor, the prosecution requests an immediate ruling from this court. Is there or is there not a Santa Claus? Well, now, I, uh, the court will take a short recess to consider the question. Hello, Henry. Why, Charlie, what are you doing here? Well, can't an old friend visit you in your chambers? And if you ask me, you never needed a friend like you do now. This Kringle case? Well, I certainly don't see what they're making such a fuss about. Henry, that Santa Claus you got out there on trial for lunacy. This case is dynamite, and you're coming up for re-election soon. Charlie, you know what happened last night? Martha brought the grandchildren over. They... They wouldn't kiss Grandpa. <laughs> they wouldn't even talk to me. There, you see what I mean? If you rule there is no Santa Claus, you better start looking at that chicken farm right now. I'm a responsible judge. How can I seriously rule that there is a Santa Claus? Because of what happens if you don't. The kids read about it, and they don't hang up their stockings. Now, what happens to all the toys that are supposed to be in those stockings? Nobody buys them. The toy manufacturers have to lay off employees. By now, you've got the Air Pavel and the CIO against you. <laughs> They're not going to say it with votes, eh? Oh, the department stores are going to love you, too. Yes, sir, Henry. And what about the Salvation Army? They've got a Santa Claus in every street corner, and they are taking a lot of money to help the poor. But go ahead, Henry. You go in there and rule there isn't any Santa Claus. But if you do, you can count on getting just two votes. Your own and that district attorney's out there. One vote, Charlie. He, he's a Republican. <laughs> oh, well, let's get this over with. The question of Santa Claus seems to be largely a matter of opinion. The tradition of American justice demands a broad and unprejudiced view of such a controversial matter. But, Your Honor... This court, therefore, intends to keep its mind open. We shall ask for evidence on either side. But the burden of proof clearly rests with my opponent. Can he produce any evidence to support his views? If Your Honor please, I can. Will Thomas Mara please take the stand? Who? Me? No, Thomas Mara, Jr. I believe he and his mother are both in court today. Hi, Papa. Hi. Tommy, do you believe in Santa Claus? I sure do. He gave me a brand new sled last year. And uh, what does Santa Claus look like, Tommy? Well, there he is sitting right over there. Your Honor, I... Overruled! Tell me, Tommy, why are you so sure there's a Santa Claus? Because my papa told me so. Didn't you, papa? Thank you, Tommy. You can go back to your mother now. See you later, papa. You certainly will. Your Honor! Don't forget, Santa Claus... This year I want a football helmet. Well, don't worry, Tommy. You'll get it. Mr. Kringle, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, sir. Your Honor, the state of New York concedes the existence of a Santa Claus. But in so conceding, we demand that Mr. Gailey stop presenting personal opinion as evidence. I insist he submit authority to proof that Mr. Kringle here is the one and only Santa Claus. Well, Mr. Gailey, are you prepared to show that Mr. Kringle is Santa Claus on the basis of unprejudiced authority? Well, well, no, not now. I, I need a little time. Why not now? Tomorrow, Your Honor. Very well. Court's adjourned till tomorrow morning. Phew. Now come, Susan, dear. Finish your supper. But I can't, Mother. All those things they're saying in the newspapers about Mr. Kringle and Mr. Gailey. Susan, they're having this trial because he says he's Santa Claus. But he's so kind and nice and jolly. He's not like anyone else I know. He must be Santa. You know something? I think perhaps you're right. Is Mr. Kringle sad now, Mother? I'm afraid he must be. Then I'll write him a letter. Maybe that'll make him feel better. I'll cheer him up and I'll tell him I believe him.
Would you mind taking this letter? Oh, sure, lady. We're going straight down to the post office now. Okay, Louie, take it away. Hey, what do you know, Louie? Another letter for Santa Claus. Hey, here's a new one. Instead of North Pole, this kid's got it addressed to Chris Kringle, New York County Courthouse. Well, the kid's right. Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. They got him on trial down there. <laughs> he claims he's Santa Claus and the DA claims he's nuts. Hey. Hey, hmm? Frankie, I got an idea. Yeah? How many Santa Claus letters do you think we got down there in the dead letter office? Oh, who knows? Must be 50,000. Bags and bags all over the joint. You, you mean but Frankie? Why not? Wouldn't it be nice to get rid of them all? Wouldn't it? Boy, oh boy. Look, Louie, as soon as we get to the post office, we go see the supervisor. You know something? I bet we both get promoted. <laughs> Since the defense has been unable to submit one shred of proof that Kris Kringle is the one and only Santa Claus, and since tonight is Christmas Eve, I ask, Your Honor, that this hearing be terminated without further delay. I protest, Your Honor, I do have evidence. Five minutes ago, you said you didn't. During Mr. Mara's oration, the bailiff handed my client the evidence I refer to. What evidence? This letter, Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Kringle? It's from Susan Walker. She believes in me. This letter means more to me than... Oh. Anything in the world. That letter, Your Honor, was delivered by the United States Post Office, an official agency of the federal government. The Post Office Department is one of the largest business concerns in the world. Last year, it did a gross volume of over $1 billion. And Your this Honor, year... I'm sure we're all gratified that the Post Office is getting along so well. <laughs> but what bearing has it on the sanity of that man? My point is that the Post Office Department is a model of efficiency. Furthermore, the laws of this country make it a criminal offense to willfully misdirect mail or intentionally deliver it to the wrong party. The state of New York is second to none in its admiration of the post office department. We're very happy to concede Mr. Gailey's claims. For the record, Mr. Mara? For the record. Anything to get on with this case. Thank you. Your Honor, that letter just received by Mr. Kringle is positive proof that a One competent... letter is hardly positive proof. I have further exhibits, Your Honor, but I hesitate to produce them. Come, come, Mr. Gailey. Put them here on my desk. But, Your Honor, I is... said put them on my desk. All right, boys, bring them in. Put them right there. Your Honor, what, what is this? Empty those mail sacks on Judge Harper's desk. But we got six truckloads out there. Bring them in. I'll be fined for contempt of court. No, just a second, oh, dear. We'll do it, Your Honor. We'll do it. True rain, true sleep, true courtrooms, anything. We deliver. <laughs> Mr. Gailey. Your Honor, every one of those letters and every one of those mail sacks is addressed to Santa Claus. The post office department has delivered them. Therefore, the post office department recognizes Chris Kringle to be the one and only Santa Claus. Since the United States government declares this man to be Santa Claus, this court will not dispute it. Case dismissed. And for heaven's sake, get this mail out of my courtroom. So as soon as I got out of court, I came straight to Mesa to see you, Doris. Oh, Chris, I'm so glad you won. Well, we're having a big Christmas party at the Brooks home tomorrow morning. I'd like so much to see you and Susie there. We'll be there, Chris. Oh, couldn't you... Couldn't you just come home now and have dinner with us? Now? Tonight? Me? My goodness, Doris, it's Christmas Eve. Oh. Alfred, look. Look who came all the way out here to the home just for our Christmas party. Chris, it's... It's Mr. Macy. Mr. Gimble, too. Oh, excuse me, Alfred. Mrs. Walker and Susie have to leave now. And I don't want to go without my Susie. But, but Susie, darling, you've got so many presents. That's the one I wanted. That's the one Mr. Kringle was going to get for me. Well, what was it? It doesn't matter. I knew I wouldn't get it, but I thought he'd at least tell me why. Susie! Susie, I'm, I'm sorry, Susie. I tried my best, You couldn't I... get it because you're not Santa Claus. Susan! Just a nice old man, like Mother said. But I was wrong when I told you that. You must believe in Mr. Kringle and keep right on doing it. You must have faith in him. But that doesn't make sense, Mother. Faith is believing in things when common sense tells you not to. Huh? I mean, 
just because things don't turn out the way you want them to the first time, you've still got to believe in people. I found that Hello, out. Hello, Doris. Oh, Fred. Mr. Gailey! Oh, Mr. Gailey! Merry Christmas, Susie. Gosh, you just got here and we're just ready to leave. Oh, I've been here, and if you're ready to leave, I'll, I'll drive you home. Well, be, before you go, here, here's a map I've made for you. Now, you'll miss a lot of traffic. About four miles south, you will see Ashley Avenue. That's the street you want, Ashley Avenue. Thanks, Chris, and a Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you, Fred, and to you, my dear, and to you, Susie. I believe, Mr. Kringle. I do. It's silly, I suppose, but I believe. I don't understand it, Fred. The map Chris gave us definitely says Ashley Avenue. We've been on Ashley Avenue stop now. Stop the car! Oh, stop the car, please! Susie, what is it, darling? What's the matter? There it is, the house! The house! S Susie, what what's in the, the world? She's running into that house. At least there's no one home. It's, it's brand new. It's just been built. Oh, for sale, it says. For sale. What on earth is that child up to? Susie! Hey, Susie! Here I am, upstairs! Come right down. You know you shouldn't run, run around in other people's houses. That's strange. Yeah, I'll say. No, no, I, I mean this house. I've seen this house somewhere. I know I have. Maybe in a magazine Mother, or... It's our house. It's the one I asked him for, Mr. Kringle. Mr. Kringle? I know it is. Oh, you were right, Mommy. You were right. Susie. Mommy told me if things didn't turn out just the way you wanted them to at first, you've still got to believe. And I kept believing and you were right, Mommy. Mr. Kringle is Santa Claus. Now where are you going? In back to see if there's a swing. Oh, there is one. There is one. You told her that about... About believing? <laughs> well, you told me, Fred. <laughs> Sign outside. For sale, huh? Well, we can't let her down, can we? I never really doubted you. It was just my silly common sense. <laughs> it even makes sense to believe in me now. I must be a pretty good lawyer. I'd take a little old man and legally prove to the world that he's Santa Claus. Now, you know that could... Fred. What's the matter? There in the corner by the fireplace... Oh, no. No. It can't be. It, it couldn't. A cane. Chris's cane. Why, there couldn't be two canes like that anywhere in the world. Silver handle and all. Hey, you know something? Maybe I didn't do such a wonderful thing after all. Our stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. Let's look in for a moment on the Smiths. In a rash moment, Bill has offered to wash the dishes. Here's the Lux. Just shake a little in the dish pan. Hey there, that's enough. Oh, why be stingy? I like lots of sides. Well, so do I. But you'll get plenty with a little Lux. Hey. It looks just like a bubble bath. <laughs> Dishcloth is there under the sink. You know, those studs won't flatten out either, like that stuff I used last week. You watch. Well, at least you used that other box up fast. I'll say. That's another reason I'm back to Lux Flakes. Why, I'll bet Lux does most twice as many dishes, because a little goes such a long way. Well, don't just admire those studs all night. Uh, 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 come back here and dry. Silly, that's a waste of time. Just rinse those dishes with hot water, and they'll dry by themselves. You know, I was just thinking... Can I count this as my good deed for the day if I get dishpan hands for your sake? <laughs> dishpan hands, nothing. You won't get red, rough hands with Lux Flakes in the dishpan. See? What's wrong with mine? Not so bad. Not so bad. Next time you do the dishes. Well, ladies, if your husband doesn't do the dishes, the next best thing is to do them yourself with Lux Flakes in the dishpan. You'll avoid dishpan hands. In fact, if strong soaps have been making your hands red and rough, just change to Lux Flakes and see how soon your hands are soft and smooth again. Now, here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. Mr. Keeley in Washington, D.C., and our stars on the stage of the Lux Radio Theater in Hollywood. For a most delightful holiday performance, all our thanks to Maureen O'Hara, John Payne, Edmund Gwen, and Natalie Wood, who return to the spotlight for a curtain call.
From Washington through Hollywood and points between, you've helped to put us in the mood for Christmas. Thanks, Bill. But we missed you at tonight's performance. As I miss being there, believe me. But here in Washington, Edmund Gwen sounded just as convincing as Santa Claus as he must have on your stage in Hollywood. Well, Bill, I wonder how many people knew that Teddy Gwen really was Macy's Santa Claus in their holiday parade. Is that right, Mr. Gwen? Yes, that's right, Natalie. In fact, I've been Santa Claus so much, I'm beginning to really believe in myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wonder, Teddy. I'm certainly going to leave the latch key in the mailbox for you Christmas Eve. No, no, just put a windsock in the chimney, Bill. You really plan to make the rounds on Christmas Eve, eh, Teddy? Well, you can't let millions of children down. You know, Mr. Gwen, you sound as if you did believe in Santa Claus. Mm, he's right, too. Didn't I just prove it? Well, why don't we leave it to the Lux Radio Theater audience? Yes. How about it, folks? Do you believe in Santa Claus? Yes! <laughs> well, that ought to reassure the children in the audience tonight. <laughs> Tell us, Bill, how's the picture going down in Washington? Splendidly. In fact, if all's well, I'm happy to say I'll be back for our big New Year's show next Monday night. Something special, Mr. Keeley? Very special, Natalie. A musical hit to warm the hearts of every member of the family. Well, let's hear what gives, Bill. Sounds exciting. Exciting it is. A play and cast that's topped our list of listeners' requests. And our stars are the one and only... Frank Sinatra... The lovely and talented singing star, Catherine Grayson, and the ever-popular Gene Kelly. In Metro Golden Bear's great hit, Anchors Away. I hope you have Frank singing the wonderful tunes from that picture, Bill. Yes, indeed. And Catherine and Gene, too. Sounds like a great way to finish out the old year, Bill. Congratulations. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And Merry Christmas to all four of you. Once again, the world looks forward to another Christmas. It would be idle to say that peace reigns everywhere on earth, that men confront the future with untroubled hearts. But this much we can say, that for one day, the world is brought together by the worship of the Prince of Peace. And if that spirit can burn so brightly for a single day, we have cause to hope that it may someday shine forever in men's hearts. On behalf of Lever Brothers Company and of us at the Lux Radio Theater, may I wish all of you the happiest of holidays. We invite you all to join us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Frank Sinatra, Catherine Grayson, and Jean Kelly in Anchors Away. This is William Keeley saying good night and Merry Christmas. Maureen O'Hara and Natalie Wood appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of Captain from Castile and Daisy Kenyon. Edmund Gwen appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Cast Timberlane, starring Spencer Tracy and Lana Turner. Heard in our cast tonight were Joseph Kearns as Sawyer, Alan Reed as Macy, Bill Johnstone as Mara, and Herbert Butterfield as Judge Harper. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Anchors Away with Frank Sinatra, Catherine Grayson, and Gene Kelly. Pepsodent won by three to one. Yes, in a recent survey, families throughout America compared new Pepsodent toothpaste with the brands they'd been using at home. By an overwhelming average of three to one, they preferred new Pepsodent with Irium over any other brand they tried. They said new Pepsodent toothpaste tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, with families who made comparison tests, Pepsodent won by three to one. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Anchors Away with Frank Sinatra, Catherine Grayson, and Gene Kelly. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>